So I'm going to talk today about uh, CO2. Um, I normally do a full morning's lecture, and so I've trimmed a bunch of stuff out of what I normally teach. Um, that includes uh, information about work that we've done in Colorado for the last 15 years using tunable diode laser absorption spectroscopy. So I've used these TDLs to measure CO2 isotopes for a long time. That's missing from this lecture today, but if you're curious about that and you want to talk about it, if you want to see one of these instruments, I can show these to you. Just grab me after uh, we're done and we're at the break and then we can set that up. Uh, so I've got a number of things that I want to talk about. Sorry about the slides. Apparently, uh, Gabe Bowen's slides from last week showed up with my title page <laughs> from the printer, and so the printer is revamping these and they should be here in half an hour or so. Um, what I want to talk about today is the global carbon cycle mainly. <clears throat> um, I'm going to explain how CO2 isotopes are used uh, to understand the global carbon cycle. Talk a little bit, bit about the Seuss effect uh, and especially the C13 version of this. Uh, describe how CO2 isotopes vary in forest air and the kinds of things that we can learn from working with isotopes in forest air. Uh, and then if there's time, uh, a little bit of discussion about isotope mixing lines. I hope we get to that. Um, because it's, it's potentially relevant for some of your, your projects. So uh, feel free to stop me at any time. We're going to start with global carbon cycle. Uh, you're probably all aware of this pattern. This is CO2 at the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Uh, over the last several decades, it's rising, and it has a seasonal cycle. So the actual data are the red line, or this is a smooth variant of the data. Uh, the black line is one that has removed that seasonal cycle. So what, what causes the seasonal cycle on CO2? Anybody know? <coughs> Lots of murmuring. Forests. Forests, okay. So this is exchange with the land biosphere. Okay, so this is a northern hemisphere site, Hawaii. And the peaks in that CO2 are the end of the northern hemisphere winter. And the valleys are the end of the northern hemisphere summer. And stable isotopes are part of the reason that we know that it's exchanged with the land biosphere as opposed to other reservoirs of carbon on the planet. So NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, runs a global air sampling program. Uh, you can find information on this website. They measure in all of their flasks the six gases that are listed there, CO2, methane, carbon monoxide, molecular hydrogen, nitrous oxide, and sulfur hexafluoride. And these, the, the last is useful for understanding transport of the atmosphere. Uh, the others are largely uh, biological in nature and tell us about uh, uh, things associated with biological processes. But importantly, the, most of those are greenhouse gases. Uh, there are some other things that are measured in a subset of the flask, including stable isotopes of CO2 and of methane. Um, and I'll show you some of that data in just a bit. Uh, there's lots and lots of other stuff measured on subsets of, of this. So you can find information about that program at, at the website there. Um, that CO2 increase at Mauna Loa that I showed you peaks now, atmospheric CO2 is about 400 ppm, okay? This is our understanding of the history of atmospheric CO2 for the last 800,000 years. Um, and this comes from Antarctic ice cores. And so this is the present out here. This is 800,000 years ago. There are oscillations here that are associated with glacial interglacial cycles. And those oscillations have a magnitude of about 180 ppm up to about 280 ppm. And since we've, the Industrial Revolution has begun, we have added another 120 ppm to that. Okay, maybe even a little bit more. So in the last 800,000 years, the global carbon cycle is receiving a perturbation that it has not seen in that, in that kind of time frame. This, the current carbon cycle is really unusual compared to the last 800,000 years. Um, there's a, a really interesting movie here. This uh, website here takes this data and kind of runs it out over time so you can look at a history of CO2, which is, a, which is worth doing. So this is a picture of the, the sites in that NOAA Global Sampling Network. And from flasks that are collected at all of these locations, we have an understanding of the global pattern of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, so this is time from 1997 to 2006. This is latitude from South Pole to North Pole, and CO2 is the color or vertical axis. And there's a couple of features there. 
the northern hemisphere amplitude of the seasonal cycle is much bigger than the southern hemisphere amplitude. So why is that? There's a radically different amount of land in the two hemispheres, right? And another feature that you notice here is that the peaks, remember I said the northern hemisphere peaks in CO2 occur at the end of the northern hemisphere winter. Those are the valleys, the same time period as the valleys in the southern hemisphere. There's still a seasonal cycle, but it's out of phase by half a year. Speaking of such things, today's the solstice. Well, last night at, at 1024 local time was the solstice, I guess. So you could either count yesterday or today. So CO2 pattern in the atmosphere, much bigger uh, seasonal cycle in the northern hemisphere. When you get to the high northern latitudes, it's pushing 20 ppm magnitude of that seasonal cycle. It's much, much damped in the, in the southern hemisphere. Atmospheric CO2 is affected, uh, is influenced by exchange with a variety of re reservoirs. And this is from the latest IPCC report, and it highlights more detail than we need. Um, but I want you to focus on a few reservoirs. Uh, <coughs> one is the land biosphere exchange here. One is the ocean atmosphere exchange. And then there's the fossil fuel production. And so in this figure, things that are black are pre-industrial and then things that are red are alterations to the pre-industrial magnitude. Data for this comes from a wide variety of sources, but it includes uh, C13 of CO2, as I'll show you in a little bit. So I want to highlight the magnitude of these. Um, there is a one-way uptake of carbon dioxide by the land biosphere on a global scale that's roughly 120 parts, uh, 120 petagrams of carbon per year, okay? There is a release that's roughly 120 they almost balance, and in, they don't exactly balance because of, uh, because of the difference in their magnitudes. But these are really, really large fluxes. When you compare these to the fossil fuel flux, this is roughly eight gigatons or petagrams of carbon per year. So the land biosphere releases 15 times more CO2 to the atmosphere than we do with fossil fuels. Right? So why should we be worrying about fossil fuels? Well, the fossil fuel magnitude is a one-way flux to the atmosphere. The biosphere flux to the atmosphere is countered by this big photosynthetic uptake flux. And the difference between photosynthesis and respiratory release on the global scale is this 2.6 number. Okay? Much smaller, much smaller than the fossil fuel flux, which is this 7.8. There's a similar exchange with the oceans. Uh, the magnitudes are a little smaller, but the overall uh, important point here is that the net ocean flux is a small number, okay, relative to the fossil fuel flux. It's a bonus for us to have these uh, net sinks in the biosphere and in the oceans because the atmosphere is increasing at a rate that's slower than it would be without these, okay. The net land sink and the net ocean sink are mitigating the atmospheric increase right now, but we don't know if that will continue. And if these very large fluxes were to change in magnitude, if the biosphere released more carbon than it took up in a given annual period, then the atmospheric CO2 increase could occur much, much faster. So it's important to understand the magnitude of these fluxes. Any questions about this so far? Okay. <coughs> So let's move on to isotopes. <clears throat> you know about the natural abundance of both carbon and oxygen, relative natural abundance on the planet. If you take a 400 part per million or micromole per mole amount of CO2 in the air and you divide it up into the normal one or the heavy C13 or the heavy O18 one, it breaks down into roughly 396 parts per million is the normal light CO2 isotope. The heavy C13 variant is about four, and the heavy O18 variant is about a little less than one. But it varies, okay? It varies based on where you are. It's higher in this room right now because you're all breathing out your breakfast, okay? In a forest, as I'll show you, at night it's higher. During the day it's lower. Um, it varies spatially on the planet because of exchanges with, uh, with reservoirs. Uh, there are other species that are important. Uh, there's an O17, which we tend to ignore because it's a problem for mass spectrometry, so we try to correct it away. Uh, there are doubly labeled species. 
where two of the atoms within the molecule are, are heavy. And those are not so useful uh, for biosphere atmosphere work, but they're tremendously useful as a paleo thermometer, for example. And I think we have tomorrow a lecture on clumped isotopes. And then radioactive CO2 is also really, really important for other reasons. And I'll talk just a little bit about radioactive CO2 in a bit. Um, that's mainly useful in studying the carbon cycle, the contemporary carbon cycle, because of the bomb signal from nuclear weapons testing in the atmosphere. And we'll get to that in, in a little bit. Okay, so top left is uh, northern Alaska, CO2 time series from 1991 to 2004. And this is the pattern that I showed you. There's the seasonal cycle and then there's the general secular increase. The increase is because of our use of fossil fuels and there's no debate about that. Uh, contrary to what you hear on the television or from Facebook or from our, our elected leaders, this is, this is really occurring. And one of, the, one of the strongest lines of evidence for understanding that comes from the use of stable and radioactive isotopes and understanding of how they move around in the Earth system. So if you look at the carbon isotope ratio of CO2 during that same time period, you see it also has a seasonality and it's roughly inverted from the seasonality of CO2. The peaks are in the summer when CO2 is low and the valleys are in the winter when CO2 is high. Any idea why? It's, it's not energy, it's the exchange with the land biosphere again. Okay, I'll take you through this when we get to the forest. So let me back up. There, there is an energy signal in here that's important and, and I'll explain that in just a little bit. But the seasonality here is driven primarily by exchange with the terrestrial biosphere. So we said that this one is low in the into the summer because of net uptake by the biosphere. Photosynthesis enriches the atmosphere. Respiration depletes the atmosphere. And I'll take you through that at a forest scale in a little, little bit. So on the bottom is oxygen isotope ratio. Sorry, this thing doesn't turn off. It's either on or off, and I, I, it's probably annoying with this going all over, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so there's an oxygen signal as well. I'm not going to talk much about that. I'll show you just one more slide about oxygen. But the oxygen isotope of CO2 is controlled by entirely different things, almost entirely different things, from the carbon isotope ratio of CO2. Any, anybody got a guess? What's the biggest factor controlling the oxygen isotope ratio of CO2? It's interaction with liquid water, Ex exchange of oxygen atoms through an equilibrium reaction. Uh, on the right of this is the southern hemisphere version. And you can see that the, the seasonal cycles are in, almost entirely damp. That's at uh, American Samoa. So using the same FLAST network that we talked about before, we can look at the global distribution of C13 of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's a similar pattern, but opposite in magnitude to the one that we saw for CO2. The peaks for CO2 are end of northern hemisphere winter in the northern hemisphere. The valleys are end of northern hemisphere summer for CO2, and it's the opposite for C13 because of the way net land uptake discriminates. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a bit. Again, a damp seasonal cycle in the southern hemisphere that's out of phase by six months. So how can we take advantage of this to learn something about the carbon cycle? It's conservation of mass. The use of stable isotopes is generally always conservation of mass, right? You try to understand the system and the processes that lead to change. You look at the reservoirs, you look at the fluxes, and you sort it all out and it all has to add up. So this is an example of conservation of mass. If you look at the change in CO2 with respect to time in the atmosphere, we're gonna just think about a global average here, but this can be spatially explicit. It is, that change is a function of fluxes exchange with the land biosphere in green here, the oceans, or fluxes that are associated with human processes. And so the notation here comes from this paper by Inez Fong, and I'm consistent with that because this was a real seminal paper for doing this work. So SFF is the flux of fossil fuels. That's the 7.8 gigatons of carbon per year that I showed you on the global carbon cycle diagram. The DEF is deforestation. As we cut down tropical forests, 
and we burn those, they're made of carbon and carbon gets returned to the atmosphere. And that is not a negligible flux. It's actually uh, significant compared to the magnitude of these others. Uh, in the oceans, there's an atmosphere to ocean flux and an ocean to atmosphere flux. So the one-way gross fluxes. And then in the biosphere, there's, I'll do this, the one on the right first, the biosphere to atmosphere. And then Inez's notation here has from the atmosphere by photosynthesis. That's what that AP means. Photosynthetic uptake as opposed to land biosphere released by respiration. So <clears throat> what do you know now since Saturday and maybe from Brian about exchange of CO2 with the atmosphere and the oceans? Where, where does CO2, how does it make its way into the ocean? Why does it go into the ocean? It's an equilibrium reaction. There's the whole carbonic acid reactions. You've got more CO2 in the atmosphere than would otherwise be there in equilibrium with the oceans. And so it goes into solution. It's going into the carbonate system. Okay? And that has a fractionation that's a small fractionation. How we showed this to you, and I'll show it to you in just a bit. It's like one or two per mil. So where does CO2 leave the oceans? Areas of upwelling. Right? So there's a spatial distinction between uptake of CO2 in the surface ocean and release, which is really coming from the deep ocean in areas where the, the deep ocean rises. The reason these are split up is because those have different isotopic signatures. Same thing is true here. The signature of CO2 that is removed by photosynthesis from the atmosphere is different from the signature of CO2 that is returned to the atmosphere. And this second equation, sorts out the isotopic variations on this conservation of mass. So here, for each of these flux terms, we've got a corresponding isotope term. And these are actually expressed in units that are referred to as isoforcing. It's a, a little uh, different than, well, ignore this. Uh, so this is something, the concept is, what is the isotope forcing on the atmosphere? And an example here, this delta capital A is the signature of atmospheric CO2. And if the signature of CO2 produced by fossil fuels is different than the signature of the atmosphere, meaning that this difference is non-zero, then it has an isotopic influence on the atmosphere. And so over here, we're dealing with the, the derivative of the product of delta and CO2. Mathematically, this is not exactly C13 mass balance. And I can explain why to those that are interested, but in a conceptual since it is identical to the C13 mass balance. So we've got mass balance for total CO2 and mass balance for C13. And we have to pay attention to the signatures of each of those fluxes. If we know those signatures and we have some measurements in the atmosphere to compare to, we can tweak these fluxes until we can match observations in the atmosphere, the seasonality, for example, that I showed you, or the increase, et cetera. And when doing that, we can then back out what the correct fluxes are. This is referred to as atmospheric inversion modeling. Same concept applies for O18. I'm not going to go into details on these exchanges, but there is exchange with the ocean. There's exchange with our, a source that's fossil fuels. There are sources that are associated with the land biosphere. And the fractionations are different because, I, as I said, the this, oxygen isotope ratio of CO2 is controlled by exchange with liquid water, okay? And so it's water in leaves, it's water in soils, it's water in the ocean. But it's the same concept. <coughs> All right, uh, the fractionation of C3 ecosystems uh, on average is around 18 per mil. C4 ecosystems are much smaller, as you know from Jim. The, Ocean atmosphere exchange has a net signature of approximately one to two. That's the equilibrium fractionation. So an important point here is that C4 fractionation and ocean fractionation, when each of those reservoirs is exchanging with the atmosphere, are similar. Okay, so C13 alone uh, has uh, challenges when sorting out uh, ocean versus C4 exchange. This is a slide that Howie probably is still showing in his lecture. Did you see this on Saturday? Maybe a nicer version of it. Uh, the main point here is that fractionation, CO2 in the atmosphere going into CO2 in solution, is a small fractionation. 
And it's associated with, with the carbonic acid reactions, as I said. Why am I ignoring ocean photosynthesis or ocean respiration, the ocean biosphere in these mass balance equations? The answer is on the slide here. Most of the exchange there is with the carbonate system. And then ocean biology operates on this stuff that's in solution, and it doesn't use it all. In fact, it uses only a tiny amount of it. So despite the fact that the ocean uh, fluxes, the ocean biological fluxes are really, really large fluxes, they're working on a much, much larger reservoir. The amount of CO2 that's dissolved in the ocean is much, much larger than that that's, that's in the atmosphere. If you go back when you get the notes to the carbon cycle diagram that I showed you, you can look at the magnitude of each of those. Actually, let me do that because um, I want to highlight. I'm going the wrong way. So amount that's stored in the ocean here is something like 38,000 of these units, gigatons of carbon. And the amount that's in the atmosphere is less than 1,000. And the amount that's exchanging here is really small compared to that overall, overall ocean amount. The, the point that I wanted to make when I just returned to this is the size of the fossil fuel reserves compared to what we've already used, there's still a whole lot to burn. And this is already causing a really large perturbation of the carbon cycle. If we burn all of that, it's going to really, really change the carbon cycle. Question? Yes. So, what are the anthropogenic um, inputs for the ocean system? Is that just accounting for? It's how it's changed since we've added extra CO2. So, when I highlighted before that CO2 is going into the ocean because we've disrupted the equilibrium, these fluxes are our best estimate of what the old atmosphere ocean equilibrium was like when there wasn't a net exchange. And now we've tweaked the atmosphere, and so the oceans are sucking up some of that. And it's because we've changed the equilibrium. Good, good question. Any other questions? How come only some of these have variances? Because like it's hard to sort these things out. Yes. So do we have an idea? Like, do we have a grasp on what the range of these actual numbers are? Uh, well, I would encourage you to look at this. Um, th this IPCC, how many of you have actually looked at the IPCC reports? They're, they're, they're if you actually look at the hard copy, it's a, it's a huge stack for the whole thing. So there's a, probably a 100-page carbon cycle thing in the physical science that will describe all those details and where these numbers come from and uncertainties. And um, then there's, beyond the science, there's all this negotiation that goes on at the meeting afterwards. And they argue about it. And somebody you know, probably politically said, well, we don't want to have that uncertainty or make that uncertainty larger. And there's more than just science in that report. But the advantage to that report is it gives you extensive connection to the literature so you can go read about whatever your favorite topic is. OK, any other questions? Sorry about the slides. I know that's annoying. Um, all right, so if you want to explain particular aspects of C13 in the atmosphere. And so here, this delta little a corresponds to the carbon isotope ratio of CO2 in the atmosphere. As I showed you with the mass balance equations, we've, got, we've measured that. And then using those mass balance equations, we can come up with a modeled estimate of that. And it can be spatially variable. And we can compare it to the observations. And we can tweak our model estimates until we match the observations. And then that allows us some confidence in the model. And the model is ultimately these fluxes, like I've just described. I, I should highlight that those, the carbon cycle diagram that I just showed you comes from a wide variety of lines of evidence. And it's a best, it's a best sense for the carbon cycle from all of these different lines of evidence. C13 of CO2 alone doesn't give you that whole picture at all. Uh, in fact, it's only just a part of the puzzle. So ultimately, if you want to describe uh, these features of the atmospheric signal, these uh, processes are important. And so what you see here is the seasonality of photosynthetic discrimination on land. This capital D is a disequilibrium. And the idea of disequilibrium, we're, we're going to go in detail into this in a sec. But that corresponds to the difference here 
of land dis disequilibrium, uh, sorry, land disequilibrium is the difference in the signature of the photosynthetic products and the signature of the respiratory products. So that, that'll make more sense in just a sec. Other features that are important, really important, is the C3, C4 distribution on the planet. As I said, C4 photosynthesis looks like ocean uptake in terms of its uh, influence on atmospheric CO2. And so you have to pay attention to the distribution of C4 plants if you're going to try to use C13 in, a, in an inversion. <clears throat> 